Welcome to WCAG, so glad to have you guys here. My name is Pastor Dustin, I'm the youth pastor here at Watford City Assembly of God, and uh, we are excited for what God is doing. Uh, if you're new to WCAG, uh, we have been in an exciting season. Uh, we, are, we are in a, a season of planting, uh, where we have planted a church in Fairview. We have purchased property in Belfield, and if you were out there yesterday helping, uh, demolish some stuff that needed uh, demoing. If you were out there mowing, cutting weeds, taking down trees, things like that, I just want to say thank you uh, for, for being out there and helping. I believe there were 11 of you guys that, that went out there, and so many hands make light work, so we're very appreciative of that. Uh, and just a lot of things that are happening, but uh, the reason that I'm up here preaching for you t- in front of you today is, is Pastor Sheldon has the great honor uh, to be in Fairview with Pastor Lane, as today we are celebrating the one-year anniversary of Fairview being a campus. So that is an amazing accomplishment. Yeah. And so we celebrate with them. We're excited for them. Uh, so Pastor Sheldon and Pastor Lane are tag team preaching over there. Uh, and so um, we're, we're just excited for that. And I don't know if this is just, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is just the way God worked it out. And I, I don't know if God revealed it to Sheldon or not, if he just made it happen that way. Uh, but uh, we also have uh, uh, Pastor Nam and Raquel, and they kick off the Spanish service today in the chapel uh, this afternoon. So not only is it the one-year anniversary of Fairview being a campus for WCAG, but we are kicking off another campus, our Spanish campus. So we are excited for them and what God is going to be doing in our Spanish community. So we're excited. Thank you, Pastor uh, Nam and Raquel, for being here. We're excited that you guys are here, and we are just uh, in anticipation of what God's going to do in and through your guys' ministry and uh, we, we're just excited. I know you guys are excited, but I'm excited with you guys. Uh, so this morning, I get the honor, I get the privilege of being able to bring the word to you. Uh, and so last week, we had a great service. Uh, Pastor Sheldon was preaching on Acts chapter 19. And I get to wrap up our summer series on Acts uh, and, and, and kind of just bring it to a close for this year. And we'll kick it right back up next summer. Uh, you're not going to want to miss next week. Pastor Sheldon starts a new sermon series on hearing the voice of God. Uh, so we want to encourage you guys to be here if you are curious and, and wondering on how to hear God's voice or how his voice could be louder in your life, to, to be here for that because you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, but we are still in Acts chapter 19. Uh, last week, Pastor Sheldon preached on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and what that looked like and that it's for today's church. Uh, and we see that, that as Paul uh, rolls into Ephesus, that he finds some disciples and he asks them uh, what baptism that they have received. They say that they have received the baptism of John, and so uh, they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Paul then uh, goes to, to speak to them and tell them that they need to, re- to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as soon as he lays his hand on them, they begin to uh, speak in tongues and prophesy, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And, and so then we see from there that there were, uh, there were some disciples that were there. And so then we see as we move into verse 8, which is where we're at, uh, that you, it'll be on the screen behind me, that it says this, Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held uh, daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. uh, This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, Heard the word of the Lord. So we see here that this is the same old Paul, all right? Uh, If you've been with us through the entire summer and through the book of Acts here, you have seen over and over again that Paul rolls into a city, and the very first thing that Paul does is he goes to the synagogue to go speak to the Jews. He is there to persuasively talk to them. Sometimes the Bible even says argue with them about who the Messiah is, and that it is Jesus. He's there to talk about the kingdom that is coming, and that it is here, and that what they have an understanding of is not correct, and that they need Jesus, the Messiah. And we see that as Paul continues to have the same uh, intentions everywhere he goes, that there are those that believe, and there are those that don't believe. And so we see as, as this scripture kicks off, as Paul uh, takes those disciples with him and takes those believers, 
He goes to the synagogue, he preaches there, he speaks for three months, persuasion, arguing, talking about Jesus, and then we see those that come up against him. Now this time there's not a mob. Last time I preached, we got to talk about the mob that was formed and attacked and went after him, and he escaped, but they went after the house of Jason. Uh, This time... They just kind of are mumbling and arguing, spreading rumors, and speaking against the way. Now, I don't know if you caught that when the scripture, when we were reading that, and it referenced the way. This is not the Mandalorian when he says, this is the way, all right? Uh, That's not what this is referencing. This is referencing the early church, the church that had just begun, the church that had received and, and were acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, recognizing that he was the one that was there to save them. This is what the way was, was the church. And I believe that it's based off John chapter 14, verses six, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way. And so we see here that the way is the church because they recognize that Jesus is the way and is the only way to the Father. So we find the way. So I just wanna bring clarification. If you've never heard that before or you haven't understood or why, why the way is there, that is what the way is. That was the name of the early church was the way. And so uh, as this continues on, Paul leaves with the believers because of all the the strife, the quarreling is going on and those who believed and those who didn't. So he decides after three months, all right, I'm gonna take the believers and we're gonna move on and we're gonna go to a different spot. I'm done at the synagogue. So then he goes to a teaching hall, uh, a a lecture hall of uh, Tyrannus, which isn't a specific person's name. That's usually the name of those that were in charge of the lectures and teaching. It was a typical name. It was a common name. It was like a title. And so he goes to this lecture hall. And so then for the next two years, we see Paul begins to to speak, preach, teach to the believers and those who were there who wanted to hear and listen. So much so that over the next, that over those two years, that the entire province of Asia, Jews and Greeks all heard about Jesus. So he's preaching, he's teaching. What's interesting to me is, is kind of a little bit of, of cultural history here uh, of what's taking place. And I like to break it down. Uh, if you're ever looking for a resource and how when you're studying scripture and you're not, you're not just reading what is here, but you want more of like a cultural background of things that's going on, uh, I would encourage you guys to, to down, or not, you don't have to download. You can go to uh, minhub.com uh, uh, and then you can go, or biblehub.com and then you can go to blueletterbible.com as well. So biblehub.com and blueletterbible.com and those are places where you can get free study Bibles to study the word of God. You can get the Hebrew, you can get the Greek, you can get the entire word study that is available. You don't have to go out and spend lots of money on it. It's free. It's accessible to every single one of you. So I would encourage you to study the word of God and study some background to see what's going on. So I find it curious. I find it interesting as to what's happening and what's going on here and as to why he's at a lecture hall. And so as I begin to study this and look into it, you come to realize that at this study hall, at this lecture hall, they're lecturing all morning long. But then their customary practice was, was to take a break for one to two hours in the afternoon. And there are commentators, there are those that say that at this time is when Paul was using to be They were all resting and taking their break. So this is when Paul was using that time at this lecture hall of Tyrannus. And, and so I just a little background there uh, with, with what's going on. Uh, but for two years, he preaches, and the word of the Lord is advanced through all that are there. If we continue on in Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 11 here, it says, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. Now, when we're speaking about this, when we're reading this, I want you to catch one thing here. The very first two words, God gave Paul was not acting on his own behalf. Paul was not acting under his name. What what Paul had been performing, the miracles he had been performing, was not on his own. It was all based off of this right here, that God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. Verse 12 goes on to say that when handkerchiefs and aprons had been uh, merely touched, uh, his skin were placed on sick people, 
they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. That's kind of crazy, right? Like, articles of clothing were used for healing and to expel spirits. Now, we need to have an understanding here of Paul and his deep relationship with God. This wasn't just a believer who had come to know who Jesus was and then all of a sudden was taking his clothes and, hey, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed, right? It's not Oprah Winfrey, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, right? That's not how this worked. Paul had a deep relationship with God, so much so that he sacrificed everything. He was willing to sacrifice everything, his life, to preach the word of God, everything. We see all the way through everywhere he traveled that there were trials, there was, there was things that going on. They, they went after him, they beat him, they were trying to kill him, he had to escape here and there. He was in a deep relationship with God. But we see that because of that, God was using him to perform miraculous miracles, things that were just crazy. And so I'm, I'm, I just got curious, I was like, handkerchiefs and aprons. Interesting. Why, why an apron? So, dig a little deeper in the word study and start looking at this. And what we find out is that while they were lecturing, there are those that believe, the commentators will talk about, where Paul was working as a tent maker before he would go and lecture. And so as he's working, he would wear an apron to do the work that he was doing. And the handkerchief was like a bandana type deal to wipe the sweat away. So God is using Paul's sweaty, worked in clothes to bring healing and freedom to people. My son played football yesterday. He's a, he plays tackle football. And um, as I've been studying this, this brought this to just a little bit of a different understanding for me. We, yesterday when I grabbed my son's nasty, sweaty jersey. And I picked it up and I was like, oh, that's disgusting. And I was like, oh. Paul had some nasty, sweaty stuff that people were stealing to go heal people. And it's just kind of interesting to make that connection, but it's kind of cool to know that God will use whatever he wants to use to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. God will use whatever he wants to use to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And if that is a, a man of God's clothing, he'll use it. Think about it. When Jesus was walking and a woman who had been bleeding for, for years reached out and touched the hem of his garment, she was immediately healed. God will use whatever he wants to use to bring healing. And in this moment, we see that God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. I don't know about you, but people being healed because of clothing articles is kind of unusual. But that was what was taking place and that was what was happening. So God gave Paul the power. And, and, and so Paul was saturated again in his relationship, his ministry with God, that even his articles of clothing were being used and God was using them to heal and deliver people and bring freedom. We continue on Acts 19 verses 13. It says this, a group of Drew, uh, Jews were traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? That's a little freaky. I know Jesus, I know Paul, but who are you? It doesn't say that they had been unsuccessful and they kept trying and trying and trying. It says that literally, as the word says, that they were going from town to town and that they were casting out evil spirits with the name of Jesus by whom Paul preached. But then they came up against one that was a little stronger, a little tougher than the rest of them. And it identified and said, I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is. I don't know you. And it goes on to say in verse 16, then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, 
attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When Pastor Sheldon asked me to preach today, and he's like, hey, you can do like a one-off message on your own, just whatever you want to come up with, or you can tie up the book of Acts. And I was like, okay. So I went to my office. I went to look up. What is it that I'm going to be preaching on? And I get to the seven sons of Siva, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. i got to cover that. But we need to recognize, guys, because I, and I'll be, I'm just going to be honest with you, that as soon as I started reading that, and I got to the end of verse 17, and I'm just like, the, the, the fear tried to come over me and tried to grip me. And I don't know that as I was reading that, if you as a congregation, if there were those of you that the, the spirit of fear tried to overcome you and grip you, and that was immediately when you go, nope, that's exactly why I don't play around with that stuff. That's exactly why when God tells me, hey, you should go pray for that person, I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, they could have issues. I've seen some weird things that they've been doing. They might have one of those, you know, those spirits, demons that are in them. And we begin to justify and we begin to come up with excuses because I've done it, so I know that you do it. Guys, I've come up with I've seen many different things. My wife and I were in LA on a missions trip. And this one lady said, hey, will you pray for us? And we began to pray over her. And this demonic voice came out and said, why are you praying for me? And it freaked us out. And all of a sudden, this sweet voice came back and goes, why'd you stop praying? Keep praying, I guess. So we keep praying. This demonic voice came out. Why are you praying for me? And there were some other choice words in there. I'm not gonna share any of those, but... It freaked us out and we left. We left, we walked away. And there was a spirit of fear that gripped us and we allowed that spirit of fear to grip us. And I often think about that was, man, if I just understood the authority in the name of Jesus, that could have been a different situation. That that woman could have been free from that spirit that had bound her. We wanna run away from those things. We don't want to be put in that position. That's why we say, oh God, I'll give you so much, but I don't wanna go any further because that requires a little bit more. And I don't know that I'm okay with that. Or we like, we want the authority, and we want to speak on those things, and we want, just like these seven sons of Siva were running around, and they were saying, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, and they were successful until they met their match, and here's why they met their match. It wasn't because the demon was so forceful and powerful that, that, that they couldn't stand up to him. It was, it, was, it was the fact that they didn't understand the authority of operating in the name of Jesus, and here's why. There was no relationship with Jesus. You cannot operate, you cannot cast out, you cannot pray, you cannot go about these things without expecting something to happen if you do not understand that when you become a son or a daughter of the Most High, you then are in his family and you then get the rights to use his name with the authority that comes in his name. Only then... Do you have the right? That'd be like me going over to Europe, and I know the the queen just passed away, but that'd be like me going over there and saying, hey, in the name of the queen, I demand to get into that building. They're gonna be like, move along, bro. Or, I don't know if you guys have seen those dudes on like YouTube, they're they're guards, those guys are mean, they're intimidating. If you look on Army Fell, you'll see some people that tried to play with them, mess with them, and they they, they get physical. (laughs) But they would move you away. You have no authority there. There's, I, I don't have a relationship with the queen. There's nothing there. But if someone who has a relationship with the queen and is one of her, her heirs, I promise you that they know they're coming and then they move and they make, they make things happen. My sons, my, my daughters, they're another example, right? When they act on, how many of you guys have ever had a kid that has said, well, my father or my mother, and they've used your name to do something and you're like, stop using my name. Don't do that. 
Well, they think, well, I got the authority. Well, my mom and dad's so-and-so, so I'm, I'm able to do this, right? They're acting because the authority that's found and because they're in your bloodline, they're, they're with you. They're your kids, right? We can come up with all kinds of different examples in our minds, maybe. But the fact is, is that when it comes to this, we are not to have a spirit of fear. Second Timothy 1, 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a power, love, and self-discipline. Or the King, Jer- King James Version says, a sound mind. That God has not given us a spirit of fear. That we don't have to fear. Because I promise you that, that if I felt it when I was reading that, preparing for this, I know that there were those who after I read that and after you saw it on the screen, you immediately were like, yeah, no. That's why I don't go down that road. Uh-uh. Because we don't recognize and understand the authority that is found in the name of Jesus. The authority that we have when we are his sons and his daughters. That when we receive Jesus as Lord of our life, we have been given the authority to use the name of Jesus. We have to act on that. We have to understand that we're not just acting and saying something and using a a name flippantly. That when we are his children, we are his, his heirs, that we have the authority that is found in the name of Jesus. As it's one thing to know a person and it's another to actually know and have a relationship with them. It's a completely different deal when we have a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's completely different. Jesus, the demon recognized. Paul, the demon recognized. And those who have a relationship with God and have accepted Jesus as Lord of their lives have been given the authority to use the name of Jesus. And I promise you that that demon will recognize the name because it's not by your name, it's not by my name, it's by the name of Jesus that there is freedom and there is healing and that there is power. There's no authority in my name. But there is by the power of the name of Jesus. Friends, it's not our name, but it's a name above all names. I need you to understand this, okay? We can do a terrible job when it comes to using the name of Jesus incorrectly. We use that name like it's just another name. When we're frustrated, when we're angry, that word, that name slips out of our mouth, not to honor him, not to glorify him. That word is to be reverenced. That name is to be reverenced. Because the word of God says that it is the name above all names. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this, Therefore God elevated him, being Jesus, to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue uh, declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to God, uh, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is not just another name. Jesus is not just something that we say. Jesus is not just something that we throw out there. Jesus is the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is the name that is above every other name. It is a name that every single person, every person that's ever been created will testify at the name of Jesus that he is Lord. And every knee will bow before the throne of Jesus. Everyone, everyone, there is authority that is found in the name of Jesus. It's not just another name. It's the name above all names. Jesus. There is authority in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. We just sang about speaking the name of Jesus, that there's peace, there's hope, there's freedom, there's power, there's healing, all because the name of Jesus There is power in his name. It is a mighty name. It is a name to be honored. It is a name to be revered. It is a name to be feared. Not as afraid and terrified, but a fear, a godly fear, a fear where we honor and we respect the name of Jesus. 
It is the name above all names. Acts chapter 19, verse 17 continues on. And I'm glad, I'm glad we just didn't end at 16. I'm glad that's not where we cut it off. Verse 17 says that the story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus. The Jews and the Greeks alike, a, a solemn fear descended on them. Again, that's the fear of respect, the fear of honor. Descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. So it didn't just end there where they saw these dudes that got beat up and then naked and running and fleeing. It just didn't end there. But because of that, Jesus' name was honored. There was an understanding of how powerful the name of Jesus is and that if you don't have a relationship with him, if you don't have the authority to speak in his name, you probably shouldn't do so. So Jesus' name was honored. It was lifted high. So we continue on in verse 18, it says this, many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantations, bo- uh, incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. What I want to do is when we focus on the scripture, we're going to kind of break a few things down here and I want to highlight a few things. Okay, number one is that many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. These were the believers. Church, in a church our size, there are gonna be those that have confessed and have come to accept Jesus as Lord of their life. But that's all we've done There has been no further growth. There has been no further giving up things because I promise you that when we give our lives to Jesus, he accepts us as we are. He forgives our sins as far as the east is from the west. He forgives them. But just because we accepted Jesus doesn't mean that we will forever just live a sinful life or a sinless life. There's still sin in the world. Satan still tries to tempt us. He still still tries to to trip us up and tear us down. He still tries. Now, so much more that when you accept Jesus, you have a bigger target on your back because now you're not doing what he wanted you to do. You went against what he wanted you to do. So you have a target. It doesn't get easier. And if you've ever been told that it gets easier once you become a Christian, you've been deceived. Jesus does bring peace. He does bring freedom. And you no longer have to walk under the condemnation, condemnation of sin and what you've done in the past. There is freedom from your past. And you don't have to walk under that. But there is also a responsibility as a believer to grow in our faith and our walk with God. That's why we encourage you to go to growth groups to have a better understanding of what the word of God says, to grow as a community with those who are around you. It's a lot harder to grow on your own when you don't do it with, with believers. So we encourage you to go to growth groups. We encourage you to strengthen. We encourage you to study the word for yourself so that you know that what we are preaching you from up here is the word of God. It's important for us that after we receive Jesus that we continue to grow in our faith. And there's gonna be times where God is going to ask us to give up things because we have fleshly desires. We have things that we want to hold on to. God, I will give you this much, but mm, this is mine. You can have all this, just don't touch this. But that's not what God wants. God wants everything. He wants it all. He wants it all. We can't get caught up with not surrendering everything to him. So we see here, that the many who, they were, they were believers and they confessed of their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery, witchcraft, brought their books and they burned them in a public bonfire. So there was action. They confessed and not only did they confess, but then they took the things that they knew they were not supposed to be doing anymore and they brought them and they gave them to the Lord and they said, you know what, we're done. Not to the point of like, well, 
I'm just gonna delete that app so I don't actually have the temptation of it and, and I'm just gonna get rid of it. There's still a temptation that's there. You can still download it. You can still go through everything. You can still go visit sites you want to visit. There's all these different things that you can still do until we put it into action just like they did and they burned the books. There's no coming back from burning books. They're gone. There's no coming back. Like if you were to take this bad boy right here, I think a lot of us might benefit from just going back to the old school flip phones. Landline. We could, I, I, I love my phone. I do a lot of it. But there's a lot of temptation that's on there. There's a lot of things that come our way. We could benefit a lot if we just surrender to God and give it to him. Guys, when I was a teenager, I've shared this with our teenagers, I, when I was a teenager, one of the things that I really loved was music. I knew every song out there that was by Tupac, any, any of the big time rappers, Snoop, any of them. But I always use the excuse, I don't listen to the words, I just like the beat. I had a system in my car, you know, I was one of those punk teenagers. I loved it. Turn it up, you can hear me three blocks away. Couldn't hear the words, but I promise you today, if you were to turn on any of those songs, I could rap, rap almost every single word with them because it took root. I denied it and said, ah, I wasn't listening to the words. I just liked the beat. But I could tell you every single word that's in them. And so when I was a teenager, God convicted me of that. And he said, I want everything from you, Dustin. Even your music. And back then, because, you know, we're not in the day of technology and digital music, I had one of those big old binders that held like 250 CDs, right? You were, you were, you were legit if you had a big old binder. And it was full. <laughs> and I remember I, we were on a winter retreat and I went out and I grabbed that binder and I came in. And I had some brand new music in there. And I remember how devastated I was sitting there and I was like, really God, this is what you want? He's like, it's what I want. I want everything from you. And right now, music, music's your God. I was like, so what am I supposed to do with this? And I felt like God say, I want you to break those CDs and throw them in the, in the trash can. You gotta be kidding me. So I pull them out and I start breaking them, throwing them in there. And all the other teenagers are like, what are you doing? Here comes out the new Snoop Dogg CD, and they're like, bro, whoa, 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 I'll take that from you. And I'm like, no. God told me that I'm supposed to get rid of it. Why would I hand it off to you for you to have the same issue? Just, you want it, you go buy it. That's on you. And I broke it. Every single CD that I had that was not of God and did not honor him and glorify him, I broke and threw in that trash can. And to this day, I can't tell you what is relevant music and what is not. And that's maybe, it obviously hasn't affected me as a youth pastor not being relevant to the teenagers because it didn't make a difference. But I don't know what new music is. I don't know any of that stuff. I just listen to worship music. I just, I listen to, to, to music that honors and glorifies God. And I'm okay with that. It hasn't set me back. It hasn't made odd things with people. I mean, I've just had a couple of odd conversations uh, with people who are like, oh, you know that new song? And I'm like, no. And they're like, do you listen to music? And I'm like, yeah, not that kind though. Because that was my conviction. That's what God wanted from me, for me to grow closer to him, was that. And so we see here where they had something that God wanted from them. They confessed, they, they, they turned from their ways, they took these books of sorcery, they went and threw them in the bonfire and they burned them up. And it cost them. This translation says that it cost them millions. If you read other translations, it talks about that it was uh, 50,000 pieces of silver and one piece of silver was worth a day's wage. So if you were to take our day's wage of $15, minimum wage of $15 an hour times a 40 hour a week, with the 50,000 pieces of silver, it was equivalent to $6 million. That's a lot of money. And I was complaining over the cost of CDs. It cost them. And for you to surrender what God wants to surrender to you, it may cost you. It's going to cost you. 
It will. But you gotta be able to surrender it. And, and church, we need to be aware and we need to be aware of what we entertain. I preach this through our students all the time, but it's for the entire church. We need to be aware of what we entertain. Just because you are a believer and you've received Jesus as Lord of your life, we still entertain a lot of junk. By the movies we watch, the TV shows that we watch, the music we listen to, even to the point where, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, our, our society today, our culture today, is very spiritually hungry, but we're not hungry for the Holy Spirit. We're hungry for everything else that's paranormal. And we start seeking things. And there are those that have been dabbling with Ouija boards. There are those that have been dabbling with, with watching demonic movies of exorcisms and things like that. And you are opening the door to a world that you do not have an understanding of or want to have open. And we wonder why we struggle. We wonder why there are things that come into our lives and why even there are those who become possessed because of the doors that we open to a spiritual world. Ephesians chapter six says that we are to put on the full armor of God, that the war that is waged is not against flesh and blood, but a spiritual battle in the realms of heaven and all around us. It is a spiritual battle. And we need to be aware of what we entertain, church. And if God is asking you to give up something, and I'm pretty sure I know that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you guys, because he does me, even this last week, there are things where God's like, hey, Correct this. God wants more from us. And as we see here, it requires us to confess, to turn away, and it may cost us, but here's the thing. The word spread like a wildfire, and it was effective. The word spread like a wildfire, and it was effective. The message of the Lord spread wildly, and it was powerfully effective. The worship team will come up. We're going to come to a close. Church, when we, when we go into this last worship song here, what I'm going to encourage you guys to do is this. We're going to open up the altars. Last week we had people that were up here to pray with you. This week we're not going to have that. What I'm going to encourage you guys to do is if you feel like the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about things that you need to address, things that you need to correct, things that you need to confess, and turn away from and leave here at the altar, I'm gonna ask you to do so and I'm gonna ask you to have five seconds of insane courage and do it. Because one of the things that you're gonna be uncomfortable with is stepping out and going forward and saying, oh, because here's the deal. You're gonna be worried about who's watching you and why they think you're going up there and what sin you committed. Guys, I was in Bible college and I felt that conviction when I was at Bible college and I sat there and I wanted to go up to the front just to worship. During the worship service, I wanted to come up and just worship. And every time I'd go to do it, I'd hear the small voice, they're gonna think you did something wrong. And it got to the point where I was like, you know what, I don't care. They can think I did something wrong, whatever. They're gonna think I'm a sinner every single day because I went up there and I'm worshiping. And we are sinners saved by grace. But I need you to understand that you need to take a step of faith. That if God is convicting, if God is bringing something, laying it on your heart that you need to correct it, I want to challenge you and encourage you to correct it, to come forward, to make that confession, to turn away from what you are laying here at the altar and giving to God, and to turn away from it and never to pick it up again. And that God is going to be honored and glorified by what you're doing. The other thing is, is that I asked Grayson to, to, to the worship team to redo uh, that song that we just sang about the name of Jesus because there's something about an understanding that when we just preached on the power of the name of Jesus, that there is a connection and understanding that when we sing a song, the next time that you're facing things, you can sing, I just wanna sing the name of Jesus. I just wanna speak his name. And there's a connection and an understanding now because there's authority in the name of Jesus that you now have and you walk in. And so I wanna encourage you, congregation, not to be afraid and not to let Satan try to rob you from what God wants to do in your life. So why don't everybody stand up? And if you're watching online, you can enter in right where you're at. Right where you're at, it doesn't matter. You can, you can God is right there with you. God is everywhere, he's all where, everywhere at once. So he's here, he's with you, he's in Fairview, he's, he's all over the place. But I'm just gonna encourage you guys to just enter in to worship, 
And if God has been dealing with you on something that you need to correct, please do so. If you need healing, I'm gonna encourage you to come forward because we can't forget that the beginning part of what we were just talking about, God was doing miracles and was healing people because of the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the same thing is here, that God wants to set us free from the things that are binding us and holding us back from going further and deeper into a relationship with God. We want to be like Simon the sorcerer and have all the power of God, but yet we don't want to do what we have to do to actually get it. Which is surrender everything to him. Always. To be obedient to his spirit's leading. So I'm just going to pray over you. I'm going to turn it over to, to Grayson and the worship team. And again, I'm going to encourage you. Take five seconds of insane courage. If you feel like God is dealing with you on something, step out. Take care of it. Turn from it and walk away and walk in the freedom and the authority that is found in Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did on that cross for every single one of us. And we thank you, Lord, that as we accept you as Lord of our lives, that we become a member of your family. And because we are a member of your family, because we are yours, because we are your children, we are given the authority that is by your name. To bind and to loosen. And so Lord, I'm praying right now that you would have your way in our hearts and our lives. I'm praying for hearts of obedience, to listen to the conviction that you bring. God, that your conviction is for correction, not for punishment. You are here to correct our path. And I thank you, Lord, that you forgive us unconditionally. Your love is unconditional. Your grace and your mercy are offered freely. So I pray, Lord, that across this room and even those watching, God would receive your free gift and walk in your freedom and walk in the anointing that you give and the authority that you give. We praise you, Lord, and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Speak Jesus over your families this morning. So shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every end. Come out over your family. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. is what we yes. stand by. And God, I'm praying right now, Lord, that you have brought freedom. God, that you have brought peace, that yes. you have brought hope, you have brought strength, you have brought healing. God, to the lives of everyone that is in this room and even those that are watching, God, I'm praying right now, Lord, that your name is honored and glorified, Jesus, that it is lifted high. And God, we recognize, Lord, that you are the name above all names and that every knee and every tongue, they, they will confess that you are Lord. God, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. And I pray right now, Lord, that as we leave this room, God, that we walk in your authority and your anointing. 
God, I pray, Lord, that for those that have received you, God, Lord, that they would find themselves, God, uh, just more and more in your presence, God. Lord, that as you are leading them and you are guiding them, Lord, that they would surrender more and more to you, Father. God, that as you ask of us, God, your word says that if we love you, we'll obey your commands, God. I'm praying, Lord, that as we accept the relationship, as we love you, God, for what you've done, we love you for being our savior. God, that in that love, we would be responsive and, and, and obedient to your spirit's leading and the commands that you give us in your word. God, we would be obedient to your spirit's leading as you convict us of things that we need to surrender to you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just anoint, God, this congregation. I pray your blessings over them. God, that they would not walk away from this room, God, from this church, discouraged, but God, that they would walk away with joy, that they would walk away in the joy that is found in salvation in you as Lord of our lives. God, I pray over those that need healing physically, that you would heal them in the name of Jesus. At the name of your name, at the sound of your name, Jesus, they are healed in the name of Jesus. For those that struggle, God, Lord, with mental, God, uh, disabilities, God, I'm praying right now, God, for healing in the name of Jesus. For those that are struggling with doubt, I pray for the faith in the Holy Spirit to overcome them and for them to be whole in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray right now, God, for us to just walk in the power and the anointing that is found in your name as your sons and your daughters. God, I pray, Lord, that we leave blessed by you. and a knowledge and an understanding that it's not by my name or anybody, other, anybody else's name, but it's only by your name, Jesus, that there is healing, that there is hope, that there is joy, that there is peace, that there is strength. So we walk in your love, God. We walk in obedience to your leading and we surrender it to you and we turn from it and we honor you and we glorify you. We praise you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.